morning respected seniors and dear friends in today's cpc we will be presenting a case uh, in collaboration with department of medical oncology and hematology so i request dr akank sagar who is associate professor in department of medical oncology hematology to share clinical details of the case ma'am good morning to everyone so uh, i'll begin with the case we had a 68 year old male he was a farmer resident of rajasthan with no known comorbidities he presented to our opt in the month of october with a history of fatigue and weakness for the past 6 months he also had complaints of multiple swellings in the neck the axilla and the groin for 6 months there was history of weight loss over the past 4 months he had lost about 10 kg of weight there was no history of any fever transfusions jaundice or any bleeding manifestations there was no other significant history on examination this patient was conscious oriented his vitals were stable on the general physical examination the patient had presence of pallor and pitting edema which was bilateral there were multiple enlarged lymph nodes in the cervical region axillary and inguinal lymph nodes and the largest node was the level 2 left cervical which was 3 into 3 cm on the per abdomen examination he had presence of hepatospinomegaly the liver was 3 cm below the costal margin and the spleen was 5 cm below the costal margin the rest of the systemic examination was within normal limits so with this background we had kept the differentials of a hematological malignancy lower down maybe some chronic infection like cox or uh, retrovirus and autoimmune diseases but again because the age of this patient was 68 so uh, this differential was lower down now this patient when he came to us he had already shown to a practitioner outside so he had certain investigations he had an outside cbc which showed a hemoglobin of 6.2 g per deciliter with a tlc of 3.48 lakhs and platelet was 59000 this was predominantly lymphocytosis and on the peripheral smear there was suggestion of presence of smudge cells as you can see here these are the smudge cells that were uh, basically uh, appreciated in the peripheral smear so what are these cells they are basically lymphocytes which are abnormal and while preparing the peripheral smear they spread out because they are friable so this was suggested in the peripheral smear so with this background we also had a imaging for this patient he had got a ct of the neck abdomen and the thorax done outside unfortunately he was not carrying the films so we just had a written report and as you can see here there were multiple enlarged lymph nodes which were conglomerated in the cervical supra clavicular region the axilla there were certain mediastinal nodes also multiple nodes in the abdomen were present as well as the iliac lymph nodes both the common iliac the external iliac nodes and the internal iliac along with bilateral inguinal regions there was presence of hepatospinomegaly so as far as lymphomas are concerned this patient had presence of nodes which was seen both above and below the diaphragm he had axillary nodes also so he was minimum a stage 3 of the lymphoma whether stage 4 or not that would be further defined by doing bone marrow examination so we had to evaluate him further so we admitted the patient and we went on to do certain lab analysis and the further investigations will be discussed by dr abhishek thank you ma'am so we received specimens of patient in our laboratory the first as we know when we start hematology we start with the complete blood count that is hemogram on our uh, fully automated hematology cell counter this is the picture what we got that uh, hemoglobin was of uh, 6.3 g per deciliter 
platelets were reduced that is 49000 and total leukocyte count was elevated that was 534000 per microliter and 85% of these cells were lymphocytes so this was a uh, uh, finding from hematology cell counter it had also flagged it as query blast so we had to examine peripheral blood smear before we go to abnormal we should see what do we expect in a normal peripheral blood smear there is a background of red blood cells against which we can see one neutrophil one lymphocyte here there is one lymphocyte a monocyte and these tiny dots are platelets so sometimes they are seen as clumps and they are also lying separately in the present case what we could see as we know the total leukocyte count was high and all most all of them were lymphocytes on a closer look they were small to intermediate sized lymphocytes however they were not blasts a few smudge cells were also there as madam has already described these are generally friable cells fragile cells while smearing they get uh, smudged on the smear next we got bone marrow examination an ideal bone marrow Uh, aspirate smears should look like this in the upper left panel a bone marrow biopsy should be like this this is for um, evaluation of cytological details and for assessment of cellularity and focal deposits in bone marrow biopsy aspirate smears were partly hemodiluted however we could see that again there was a diffuse infiltration of uh, lymphoid cells 95% of bone marrow cells were lymphoid cells and on bone marrow biopsy although this was fragmented but still still we could find out places where we could make out that bone marrow was hypercellular and it was showing diffuse replacement by monomorphic small to medium sized lymphoid cells so at this point we knew that we are dealing with some uh, lymphoma the, most likely this is non hodgkin lymphoma and uh, uh, we call it chronic lymphoproliferative disorder because the bone marrow as well as peripheral blood is also involved the next thing is required is characterization of this lymphoma for that we require immunophenotyping immunophenotyping it can be done by either flow cytometry or by immunohistochemistry as we have started facility of flow cytometry so when we went ahead with flow cytometric immunophenotyping so now the question why flow cytometry is there any added advantages from flow cytometry yes what we can do is rapid assessment of large number of cells multiple parameters can be assessed at the same time the accuracy is high and there is a added advantage of reproducibility there is no subjectivity this is just an objective assessment we will go through this objectivity in subsequent part there is ability to analyze many samples quickly at the same time capable of data reduction permanent data storage this can be stored in our computers in clouds on and we can share it with people sitting in mumbai or new york ability to reanalyze people there they can analyze in their own way and it requires relatively very small sample and the turnaround time is very good in an ideal situation we can report a sample in 2 to 3 hours so how does flow cytometry work Uh, for people from non medicine non pathology non pediatrics background i will say you must have seen this area that is jodhpur airport <coughs> what we do we go we go inside we stand there in queues we put our cabin luggage in baskets and we put that in a rack which goes through one scanner in a scanner there are certain properties which Uh, helps identification of uh, various properties of the object which is passing through it and a person sitting near screen is looking at these various parameters and trying to identify whether uh, this is uh, suspicious or not so this is how some immunophenotyping or phenotyping is done of the um, luggage which is passing through so similarly flow cytometry also works so i would like to tell you 10 quick points about flow cytometry so uh, what is flow cytometry it's measurement of cells when they are flowing in a single uh, cell stream so cells they are passing through uh, some liquid and they are in a single cell suspension and counter uh, this analyzer is counting them so basically this is a technique which measures and analyzes multiple characters 
of single particle in our case these are cells when they are passing in a fluid stream through a beam of light beam that is laser light three properties are identified first is physical property size shape and granularity antigenic properties cells it has many antigens on the surface within the cell in the cytoplasm at times uh, near nucleus so these are identified with the help of certain fluorochromes and intracellular organelles and dna intracellular proteins can also be identified the basic principle is passage of cells in single file in front of laser so they can be counted they can be detected they can be sorted they can be phenotyped the third point light scatter this is physical property of any cell or particle which refracts or scatters light when it is passing through a laser beam we can see some part of the light is going straight some is refracted deflected that is forward scatter and side scatter forward scatter the light going <coughs> in the line <coughs> in the same line and the side scatter which is going at some angle <coughs> based on side scatter and flow scatter uh, uh, side scatter and forward scatter we can identify three type of cells in a solution that is lymphocytes monocytes and granulocytes then we require one more property that is fluorescence we all know we have read in our schools what is fluorescence the light emitted during decay of an excited electron to its basal state so we use some uh, particles that is fluorochromes and they are tagged with antibodies these antibodies are worked to bind to antigens which are present on cells and they will be detected how we will see so fluorochromes are components of molecules which absorb light at one wavelength and re-emit at longer wavelength we can see this and when this is emitted this light is detected by detectors so if light is detected means the antigen is present on cell if light is not detected means no antigen is present based on various antigens present on these cells we try to identify what is the type of cell as we are doing in immunohistochemistry and this is done with the help of flow cytometer which is an instrument which illuminates cells as the flow in a front of a light source that is laser and detects and correlates the signals from illuminations what are components there are four basic components fluidics optics electronics and data analysis we can see this is the basic structure of flow cytometer the part which is helping sample to flow through the flow chamber is called fluidics and the liquids required then uh, laser light is uh, projected onto the cell suspension and the refracted and scattered light is also collected with the help of filters that is optics and then this is uh, detectors are there and they digitize the signals this is called electronics fluidics specimen sheet fluid and flow chamber is fluidics laser filters mirrors photodiodes these are optics electronics is something which is converting detected light signals into electronic signals and these electronic signals are then digitized and <coughs> these are digitized amplified and they are analyzed how do we analyze every single cell is producing one pulse <laughs> every single cell is producing one pulse and this is detected we can detect with the help of histograms dot plots contour plots most commonly we use dot plots the next thing is gating we can see there is one circle <clears throat> so we try to circle means we are gating we are trying to identify part of this population <clears throat> part of this population and further uh, evaluation of this population only is done so what we are doing so the out of this population sitting in audience i am trying to get this part and then i will try to find out who these are whether they are from medicine pathology biochemistry psychiatry so we are trying to identify further last point we use panels in a single tube we can add 10 12 antibodies <coughs> specimens you know, specimens generally what we are using is peripheral blood bone marrow aspirates in due course of time we will be starting with fnac samples also which can be derived from 
स्प्लीन लीवर और मोस्ट कॉमनली लिम्फ नोड्स देन दीज सैंपल्स आर प्रोसेस्ड एंटीबॉडीज आर एडेड दे आर वॉस्ड लाइज लाइज रेड ब्लड सेल्स आर लाइज एंड दे आर एनालाइज सो आई एम कमिंग टू प्रेजेंट केस दीज आर स्केटर्स विच वी जनरली सी इन अवर टेक्सट बुक्स सो वी विल गो वन बाय वन सो एवरी डॉट इज वन इवेंट इवेंट मीन्स वन सेल हियर वी कैन सी दैट फॉरवर्ड स्केटर साइड स्केटर एज आई हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्क्राइब इट विल सेपरेट सेल्स इन टू monocyte granulocytes and lymphocytes but majority of cells here are lymphocytes we further we have gated now we will be evaluating this particular population only further we are using here cd45 cd45 is a leukocyte common antigen all cells of hematopoietic systems they are positive but with the help of side scatter we can divide into two types that is granulocytes and lymphocytes so this population is lymphocyte we will further evaluate this population with the help of cd19 cd19 is a lymphoid marker for b lymphocytes so we are trying to find out which cells are positive for cd19 so majority of these cells are we can see there is a shift in fluorescence Uh, we can see there is zero, ten to the power four, ten to the power five, six. So whatever cells are beyond ten to the power four, that is positive. Generally, it is considered positive, mild, moderate, or bright positivity is labeled. So all of these cells are CD19 positive, which are in the gate, pink colored cells, which are here. These are. part of lymphocytes but these are not b lymphocytes these are normal t lymphocytes of the peripheral blood we are excluding these cells and we will analyze only these cells these cells are we can see positive for cd5 already we have seen these are positive for cd19 we are looking at expression of cd23 which i think anybody can make out that this is negative here so the cell population is cd5 positive cd19 positive but cd23 negative CD two hundred, this is also negative. CD thirty eight, this is also negative. CD thirty eight is a marker for plasma cells. CD two hundred, a very specific marker to distinguish between uh, two lymphomas. I will come to that. And this is also negative for CD ten. Here we can see the name CD ten, and this is negative. Population is positive for CD nineteen. Further, we can see this is showing positivity for CD twenty also. CD5 is already seen positive. CD23 again already seen negative. 523 expression we generally see whether it is showing co-expression. It is not showing co-expression. We move to the next tube. Again we are getting CD19 positive cells. Further analysis will be done on these CD19 positive cells. <coughs> these cells are very uh, dimly positive for CD43. Majority of these cells are either uh, my mid. Uh, Uh, dim positive or negative next we can see that cd 11c is negative we can see that uh, igm is positive that is surface immunoglobulin m that is positive cd 79b is bright positive cd 19 is already known is positive cd 123 is negative then we look at assessment of clonality with the help of kappa or lambda light chains lambda light chains we can see is not seen but all of the cells these cells are positive for kappa so it is showing only one type of light chain so it is showing light chain restriction suggestive of clonality so if we look at all markers what we could find that positive markers are cd19 cd5 cd79 b cd20 surface igm and kappa chain restriction we take uh, negative marker cd10 this is generally for follicular lymphoma it is negative in this CD twenty five, eleven C, one zero three, one twenty three. These are markers of hairy cell leukemia. Although it was not suspected in this case, based on morphology, but still we have to do immunophenotyping. Many a times morphology may not help, and we have to go for advanced techniques. CD forty three, CD two hundred were largely negative. So these are markers specific for uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia slash small lymphocytic uh, lymphoma. <coughs> also. there was no co-expression of cd5 and cd23 and cd23 in isolation was negative so at this point we can make out that this is a cd5 positive non hodgkin lymphoma 
and the most common entities uh, in CD5 positive non-Hodgkin lymphoma are chronic lymphocytic leukemia and mental cell lymphoma. So we suggested that this is a case of mental cell lymphoma. Mental cell lymphoma, uh, in, there is a hallmark uh, translocation, translocation between chromosome number 11 and chromosome number 14, which gives rise to trans, uh, fusion transcript and that can uh, cause, that causes amplification of uh, CCND1 gene and we need to document this by either immunohistochemistry or by FISH studies. We do not have FISH studies at this point of time in our institution, so easily available is immunohistochemistry. So on bone marrow biopsy, we did cyclin D1 and this showed positivity in majority of cells. This is nuclear positivity. You can see brown color of the cells. Further, there is again one more sensitive and specific marker, SOX11, that was also done and that's all also came positive. So finally we knew that we are dealing with a case of mental cell lymphoma. So diagnosis was given. This is as I had described that detection of uh, the genetic hallmark of MCL that is mental cell lymphoma is chromosomal translocation 1114 either by IHC or by FISH. We did it by with the flow cytometry and IHC. So next is uh, required we will be doing again clinical pathological correlation. So over to Dr. Akangsa for further discussion of the case. Thank you, sir, for that very interesting and uh, comprehensive overview of flow cytometry and how we actually came to the diagnosis for this particular patient. So further, just a table on the various investigations that were done uh, for this patient while he was admitted with us. As you can see here, when he presented to us, uh, he had very high counts. And along with that, uh, he also had presence of tumor lysis. So that is basically because of the excess tumor burden, there is spontaneous lysis of these abnormal cells. And that can be seen here with the uh, uh, high uric acid, as well as uh, the potassium also was uh, higher for this particular patient. And when he came to us, the phosphorus was also very high. So uh, what we did was in this particular patient that uh, we managed him for tumor lysis syndrome giving adequate hydration as well as uh, there is an agent uh, called as rasburicase, we administered that. And then uh, once his uh, lysis was uh, uh, stabilized, we started him on therapy with uh, bendamustin and rituximab regimen. I'll be coming on to the discussion of uh, therapy for uh, this particular entity. And uh, uh, rituximab was given at the dose of 375 milligram per meter square on day one and bendamustin at the rate of 90 milligram per meter square on day one and two. So this patient, he tolerated the chemotherapy well and was discharged subsequently. So briefly about uh, the uh, treatment of mantle cell lymphoma. So uh, this is basically a lymphoma which is seen majority of the patients are male and the median age is around 60 to 70 years. Most of the patients will present with advanced stage and uh, leukemic phase is seen in 30% of the patients. Extranodal sites are very common, especially the GI tract and there is a variable clinical course. And this comprises of 6% of all the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the clinical spectrum of mantle cell lymphoma ranges from the indolent type, which is seen in 15% of the patients. And as the patient acquires certain further somatic mutations, the disease progresses to either the classical form, which is most commonly seen in 80% of the patients, and the blastoid variant or the transformed variant, which is seen in 5%. So this is the uh, variant where you, know, there you would have very high proliferation and uh, the patient will present with a uh, very uh, severe and high tumor burden. So what is the goal of our treatment in these patients? So first of all, we want to achieve remission in these patients and also secondly, we want to maintain that remission. We want to give therapy in such a way that we may minimize the toxicity in these patients, especially because they are elderly. Many of them will have comorbidities. The uh, performance status of these patients when they present to us is also not very good. We want to prolong the progression-free survival, improve the quality of life if possible, and we need to understand that some of these patients, not all, they, would, uh, they can be put on observation as well. So we have to decide according to the patient's condition whether he can be observed. Uh, uh, if he has an indolent type of mantle cell lymphoma, we can observe the patient for quite some time. 
So previously when mantle cell lymphoma, it was discovered back in 1980s. And uh, you can see here in this particular uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that initially the survival of these patients was less than 10%. But now with the improved therapy and inclusion of the monoclonal antibodies, most commonly used is rituximab, the survival of these patients has definitely improved. And now almost uh, it is reaching up to 60 to 70%. So when we get a patient of mantle cell lymphoma, we have to prognosticate. Of course, the patient comes to us, the attendants will ask us, what is the prognosis of this disease? How much more time does he have? So we have certain scoring, uh, uh, scoring systems for these uh, patients. And for the mantle cell lymphoma, we have the mantle cell lymphoma international prognostic score. So this comprises of certain points. You can see here the age, the performance status of the patient, the LDH levels are very important, and the baseline WBC counts. So as the, uh, you can see here, the, all these points have certain uh, scoring system, and accordingly, the patient can be classified as a low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And in this particular curve, you can see that patients who have low risk of disease, their survival, probability of survival is much better than the ones who have a high risk disease. And this was a Nordic study which showed that with the improvement in the therapy, the median uh, event-free survival or the prog progression-free survival in these patients has now increased to almost 8 to 10 years. And the median overall survival is more than 10 years. So when we come to the phases of treatment, this is the basic concept. First, you, give, uh, you need to bring the patient into remission. So induction therapy has to be given, which comprises of chemoimmunotherapy, that is chemotherapy along with the immunotherapy in the form of monoclonal antibody. And after this, once the patient has achieved remission, you need to put the patient on maintenance and consolidate that remission. So that can be done with the help of certain agents which I'll be discussing or with the help of a stem cell transplant. So these are the treatment options for mantle cell lymphoma. Our patient, as you can see here, he was above 60, uh, 65 years of age. He did not have any organ dysfunctions. His LFT and RFT were normal. But uh, of course, his performance status was around 1, ECOG 1. So we decided to give him uh, some uh, sort of therapy which would not be very intensive because you want to minimize the therapy, but at the same time it would be equally effective. So for these patients, the uh, uh, first line therapy, uh, you can include either giving the R-CHOP chemotherapy or the bendamustin rituximab chemotherapy. There are other agents also like Hydros uh, Citrabine which can be given because, uh, but again, the toxicity is high. So you need to judge according to the patient's condition. And very important is that these patients, since they are not very good candidates for a st autologous stem cell transplant, which can be done for a younger fit patient, these patients need to be given rituximab maintenance. So why is our bendamustin preferred over our chop? So most of the other NHLs like DLVCL, we give RCHOP as the first line therapy, but this was a study, the BRIGHT study, which was reported in the Lancet by uh, Ramal Latal in 2013. They had clearly shown that the incidence of the uh, uh, achievement of CR rates with patients who receive BR, which is bendamustin rituximab, is much better than the ones who receive RCHOP. And also the toxicity seen with BR are much less as compared to RCHOP in terms of your neutropenia infections. So what is the role of maintenance rituximab? This was a study which was reported uh, in uh, uh, the um, Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2022. And you can see here in these uh, curves over here, this is basically talking about the time to next treatment, which means indirectly it, uh, basically is indicative of the progression-free survival. So patients who receive bendamustin rituximab or the RCHOP therapy, if they are not given further maintenance rituximab, their outcomes tend to be poorer as compared to those who have received maintenance rituximab. So this was clearly shown. It was a study of almost uh, more than 1,000 patients, and it was a multicentric study. 
And uh, as compared to the, uh, this is for the progression fee survival, when you look at the overall survival, again, the overall survival, although the curves are not very separate, but definitely there is a uh, slight survival, overall survival advantage in patients who receive the maintenance rituximab. As far as transplant is concerned, which is the autologous transplant for patients who uh, receive chemotherapy, when you uh, give in the first uh, CR, you need to consolidate the therapy with autologous transplant in such a way that it helps in improving the progression-free survival. And there are certain newer therapies also on horizon, which are basically less toxic, more of immunomodulatory therapies, which includes the BTK inhibition, other bispecific antibodies are there, which basically target the various uh, CD antigens on the T cells and uh, lead to a, a destruction of the mantle cell lymphoma tumor cells. Other agents include the CAR T cell therapy, which is now very, very popular. Even uh, India is now uh, at, at Tata Memorial Hospital, we are having indigenous CAR T cell generation. So coming back to our patient, now he's currently admitted with us for his second cycle of chemotherapy. As far as his clinical examination and symptoms go, he has definitely uh, had a regression of his lymph nodes. Even the spleen has regressed. And uh, we are planning to do an interim evaluation after three cycles of therapy. So. Thank you, ma'am. So we have seen the case. In the end, what would be the take-home message? We frequently see in our practice that Patients with uh, high lymphocytosis, they are being followed up without characterization. Cases are labeled as, okay, lymphocytosis is there, smooth cells are seen, it should be, or it should be, or it would be, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But no, the course and the treatment required of these two diseases, which are close uh, differential, that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and mental cell lymphoma is totally different. So we should try to... Uh, immunophenotype these cases and bone marrow and immunophenotyping is very important. Very important thing is communication between laboratory and clinic. And discussion is the key and not all lymphomas are treated in the same way. Hence, correct diagnosis is very important. The list of acknowledgement is very long uh, for procurement of reagents for flow cytometry. Uh, we are very thankful to previous director sir, MS sir, Meethu Banerji ma'am, Dharamveer sir, and my department, the whole department, including HOD ma'am. And then uh, I would say thanks to the whole hematology team, Dr. Akangsa, who is newly joined in hematology, Dr. Siaram, Dr. Gopal, our hematopathology fellows, Dr. Kushbu, Dr. Tejasvi, and technical staff. And we can see integration is required between laboratory part and the clinical part. And that is the theme of uh, upcoming hematology update in January. With that, I would say thank you. Uh, we can answer if we have any questions. So my question is regarding rituximab. So some people follow, like you people follow weekly protocol, dosing per meter square. Uh, you might people follow two weekly protocol, dosing it different. We follow both the protocols. So what's the pharmacological basis for using, what's the rationale for using weekly protocol in lymphoma and two weekly protocol in RA? So, uh, so it depends on, like we, when we use rituximab, it is not given as a single ther agent. So it is combined with the certain cytotoxic agents like cyclophosphamide, vincristin, and uh, doxorubicin. So why it is given at a certain interval is because you are anticipating toxicity and uh, there would be uh, toxicity probably in the second week of therapy with uh, in these agents in combination with rituximab. So that's why certain protocols like RCHOP is given every 21 days. Bendamestin is also an alkylating agent and uh, that uh, the BR therapy is given at 28 days interval. So I think it is because of uh, this property that uh, the various protocols are given at either 21 days interval or 28 days. So if you are using rituximab as a single agent because we know that it will not cause uh, uh, cytopenias and uh, it is basically an immunotherapy. So that's why 
some of the protocols, even in lymphomas, where we are giving uh, for certain uh, lymphomas like uh, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, it can be given, rituximab can be given on a weekly basis. But that is when it is being given as a single agent. Uh, in splenic marginal zone, uh, we are giving it as a single agent weekly. Rituximab is given weekly. For uh, the lymphomas, we are uh, commonest protocols being used are RCHOP, which is given every 21 days, or Bendamustin Rituximab, which is given every 28 days. Sir, regarding uh, flow cytometry, uh, we are commonly using in the diagnosing the hematological malignancy. Uh, are we using uh, flow cross match? Are we uh, capable of doing cro flow cross match? Because it has an important significance in transplants. So what is the status of flow cross match? Sir, we recently started our services. So yes, we will be doing uh, this part also, sir, in due course of time, sir. We, will, we have started the process for procurement of relevant reagents. In due course of time, we will be starting, sir. Uh, Ma'am, regarding the this case, uh, it is a uh, blast crisis. There is a blast uh, in the periphery in this case. So, allogenic transplantation is more beneficial in such case, or autologous is more beneficial in such. Case? And what are the data? What what is more favoring to which type of therapy? So, for mantle cell lymphoma, uh, it is as of now the current uh, standard of treatment is that if it's a young, fit patient, you need to consolidate the your remission with an autologous transplant. For frontline uh, uh, CR, we do not use an allergenic transplant in these patients because that tends to be uh, very toxic. There, there is a very high chance of uh, transplant-related mortality in these patients. So uh, only in very specific uh, um, conditions where the patient is carrying a TP53 and is not having response to the chemotherapy that you would consider an allogenic. Another thing is that autologous transplant is only done if the patient should have at least some chemoresponsive disease. If the patient is not having any response to the therapy, then even autologous transplant will not help in such a case. So that is uh, very important. For this particular patient, he was uh, 68 years of age. So as of now, uh, allogenic transplant would have been extremely difficult even if uh, this patient uh, was not responding to therapy. Allogenic transplant, would we would prefer it for a young, fit patient. So that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.